The Tech Museum of Innovation is a valued community resource for all age groups. Their mission is to inspire the innovator in everyone. The Tech is creating a culture of innovation that can inspire you. Stay tuned and get inspired. The Tech Museum of Innovation is just that. It's a place for anyone of any age to get inspired. It's a place that constantly finds new innovations and creates new exhibits. It's a place where science meets imagination right here in our community. I'm Val Jeffrey for The Better Part. Our two guests today are Anya Scholz, designer of the biotech experience at the Tech, and Jimmy Snell, training supervisor at the Tech. Welcome to The Better Part, both of you. It's great to be here. It is great to be here. And congratulations to the Tech for the very prestigious award from the White House. Oh, thank you very much. The um, ceremony, I understand, um, was attended by the First Lady. In 2015, we won the National uh, Recognition for Museum and Library Service that was awarded to us. And so our president and CEO, Tim Ritchie, went with a community representative from Washington Elementary School to go visit the White House where it was presented by Michelle Obama herself. What's the significance of the award? It's awarded to people and museums and organizations that are doing work that go outside the bounds of what normal museum and libraries can do. So for us, it was awarded to us because of our service um, that we provide to the, uh, to the community, really, about the Tech Awards, um, the Tech Challenge, as well as the work that we're doing with our low-income neighborhoods around the Bear Area, where we allow them to come and visit our museum for free. How was the tech born? I mean, this is Silicon Valley and sometimes they start in people's garages, mm -hmm. they're in dorms, student <laughs> dorms, or even in people's houses. So, so how we did actually, it get born? We actually have a very similar story to that. We were created by a group called the Junior League of Mid-Peninsula um, Silicon Valley, or Palo Alto, I'm sorry. and they wanted to create a science center that was devoted to learning and technology. So in 1990, they opened up a tinkering and maker space that's called the garage. It was downtown in the old civic center. And then in 1998, we opened up our permanent facility and it's been there ever since. What's the goal of the tech um, and the mission of the tech? Our mission of the Tech Museum is to inspire the innovator in everyone. We believe that Technology has the power to change the world, and we believe that everybody has the equal opportunity to access it and know how to use it to do that. So Anya, the tech has a big focus on STEM education. What is STEM, and um, how can it benefit? STEM itself stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math, and we really think of STEM education as being the place to inspire and engage the next generation of creative problem solvers in those fields. And we think that the skills you learn engaging in STEM education are things that are not only valuable to those fields themselves, but also apply to your life outside of science, technology, engineering, and math, um, and are valuable skill sets that everyone can acquire and is valuable for every young person. Is it also beneficial for older folks too? Of course, everybody. Um, and we love engaging families in sort of STEM education, so you get the cross-generational engagement and kids inspiring their parents to step outside of their comfort zones, um, and then parents also engaging with their kids in new ways. How long have you been adopting this system? It's always been sort of one of our core philosophies is to engage people in STEM education. In particular, the Tech Museum has a, a certain flavor of STEM education that is um, our area of expertise, and that's design challenge learning. Um, and that's a model where we take STEM education and try to really inspire people to be creative problem solvers by posing a challenge that has many possible solutions. So there's no right or wrong. You come in and you bring in your own ideas, your own inspirations, and 
look at possible solutions and test them out and try them again and again and come up with your own ideas. And that's really sort of the core of our, our, our ideas about how we can use STEM education to inspire an innovator in everyone. What kind of things do the students and the teachers do? Because um, when Jerry and I visited, there were groups of students all over the place doing different activities, looking at displays and hands-on things. There's so many choices to do. So what, what do they actually do when they come in as a group from the school? Uh, hopefully they get to taste a little bit of all of those different kinds of experiences. Um, the tech has the sort of exhibits and experiences that exist on the floor at all, the, at all times. And when a school group comes in, they have the opportunity to engage with those exhibits. Like you said, some of them are hands-on. Some of them are more interacting with media elements and learning a certain concept. Um, and then in addition to the floor activities and exhibits, they can go take in an educational IMAX in our IMAX theater um, on a whole variety of topics as well as even pre-book a lab experience, which allows them to go a little bit behind the scenes in a little more classroom setting and dive a little bit deeper into a subject like chemistry or physics or electricity. And then it's the combination of, of these variety of experiences that we hope really engages a diverse audience. And when the student groups leave the museum, have these inspired experiences that will continue to stay with them outside of the museum. Um, and educators have, have told us that oftentimes this seems to be the case and that's really what we like to hear as museum educators. Right. Is it the teacher that chooses which sections that they're going to go to or do you have a program it, for that? It varies a little bit depending on the choice of the school group. Um, we definitely have suggested experiences depending on the age group um, and you can pre-book experiences if there's a specific activity that you want to make sure your school group gets, um, but they also usually give them some sort of free time to explore on their own. I noticed um, while we were there as well, the kids were using their ticket and putting it in a machine to find out how they were doing. And the idea behind that is to give people the ability to um, have their museum experience stay with them longer and engage across different timelines and interactions between exhibits. So that ticket is sort of like their passport and as they go around the museum they tag in and if they create something at one station they can save it to their online account, um, their smart museum account. And they can look at it later, they can interact with it later, they can share it with their friends. It's a great resource for teachers because as students engage in things they can then look at it back in the classroom. Um, and it's a platform for finding out more about whatever you've experienced. So Jimmy, how do you book um, a visit to, to the tech and how much time do they need in order to get in? Uh, do, do you get really booked up? So we do. Um, typically around the start of the school year, we get a lot of interest from school groups that want to come down to book it they would just visit our website thetech.org and go um, follow the links there to our booking page and they can get instructions from there to follow through at the beginning of the year it's wide open and as it goes throughout the year it gets a little bit more harder to find open spots the tech studio is a workshop which is open to everybody mm -hmm. what kinds of things do you do in that area um, well, like you said, it's a workshop space and that sort of is the inspiration when you walk into the space. It's full of tools and supplies and equipment um, to build and do things. They also have the opportunity to engage themselves in building activities, basically. So as Jimmy said, one of the foundational elements at the start of the tech was this tinkering makerspace. And so our, the tech studio is our current version of a makerspace. And so they get to do things like design a wind-powered uh, vehicle to transport a whale from one side of the room to the other, for example. So that's their challenge. How would you save a whale if you had to transport it using only the wind? Or another example of an activity they can partake in is um, designing a DIY prosthetic to help you pick up an object from a different location. And all of these activities are done using pretty basic household supplies and it's that concept of inspiring people to be creative using things that everybody has and the tools and the space that surround them. Okay, well let's take a little minute to talk about the 3D printer. You very kindly brought it in. Can one of you explain to me 
how it works and how long it takes to do it? Uh, 3D printing is, is basic additive manufacturing. So you take a three-dimensional object and it gets broken down into thin layers that can be fed into the printer so the computer can understand it. And then that nozzle extrudes plastic and prints one layer at a time and builds on top of the layer below it to produce a three-dimensional structure. And we use it a lot in the museum for prototyping. Um, we use it for prototyping the experiences we're designing, and then we also have workshops and those kinds of things that let visitors actually use it for um, their own creations. So what do you need to start? Do you need a photo or a, a file, or how does it start? You need a, a, 3D, a 3D file of some kind. Um, and so there's a lot of ways you can create that 3D file. Um, and I myself am not an expert at creating 3D files, but if you have one, you can, you can draw it in any sort of CAD software mm -hmm. on a computer. Yeah. These days, we're starting to have the tools to do things like 3D scanning, which is really fun. So you could like stand on a platform and 3D scan you, and then once you have that 3D file of you, you could print a, a 3D doll. But, so there are starting to be more ways of, of creating those three-dimensional files. Um, and then once you have that, it just has to be in a format that can talk to the computer and the specific printer that you have. Because remember, it has to take that three-dimensional file and basically slice it into 2D into slices layers. that the, the printer yeah. knows what then to print at each layer. There's so much technology. And I'm thinking about the students being there and touching all this stuff. How do you get them over the, um, the fear of failing so that they can be inspired and innovate? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. And one of the fun things about that question is that it's something that kids naturally are, naturally are way better at than adults. Um, so we perhaps live in a society where people are too scared of, of failure um, and are worried about not doing something correctly the first time. But a young kid oftentimes hasn't encountered any of that. And so we design experiences that engage people in problems that have many solutions. So there's no correct right answer. There's no wrong answer. And we create an environment that encourages failure as part of the process, um, not as an, a negative sort of end of the process. It's a, it's a part of the process that drives learning. So if you take a big risk and design something that doesn't work, you've learned a lot. And in your next design, you can now improve it based on those learnings. And so by creating experiences that do that, we help people learn that it's OK to have failure as part of the process. Um, and then oftentimes, we, when you have a family setting, it's like you, you let the kids show the parents how to think really big and just try anything. And you helped uh, design the bio design studio, another unique um, <laughs> offering. Tell us about that. Yeah, the bio design studio is our newest exhibition. And it really is unique in a lot of ways. It is one of the first permanent large scale exhibitions that's tackling subjects such as bioengineering, synthetic biology, biological design. And I know those are all big words, and that's, there's a lot of complexity that, that sits in those areas. Um, but we really thought it was important to bring those concepts to the public, because in the next 10, 20, 30 years, the ability to use biology and living systems in design and engineering is only going to increase how much, it's only going to increase in significance and how much we can impact, you know, the world and the future and human, human lives in general. So we wanted to create an exhibition that not only brings those topics to the public, but lets them engage with it in a way that empowers them. So the, the underlying goal of the whole experience is to let visitors play and build and create something with biology, not just see what somebody else has made with biology, but personally experience what it means to like design something with a living system. And so we do that in a whole variety of ways. We use physical exhibits, digital exhibits, and then living exhibits as well. And so there's a few really fun ones. Um, Creature Creation Station is one of those. And in that experience, visitors use tangible building blocks to basically design a program for a virtual creature that they're working on. And so they can use these building blocks to create a program and then put it into their creature and test how it works. Once they're happy with their creature design, they can release it into this immersive simulation space that's actually a 30-foot screen, so it's massive. And then when it is in that space, it lives with all of the creations that other visitors have made. So you have this big world where your creature interacts with everybody else's, and you can see it behave based on what you wanted it to do. So this is an example of you can design with biology now. Um, and then next to it, there's a living colors lab that lets you do 
sort of that, but in actual living things. So you take a, a real bacteria and put real DNA into it and make it change different colors. Wow. So you, um, the, the counterpart of the design, the virtual design and the, the living system with the real tools is a fun balance. Um, and then the final space I'll mention is uh, one of the more unique spaces in the new exhibition, and that's the biotinkering lab. Um, and the concept there is to create sort of a first of its kind community bio lab that's crossed with uh, makerspace ideas in a museum setting. So this is a space where people can come in and start to use in the real world the tools of biology and design and, and actually experiment and explore in a more open-ended fashion. Um, mm. And one of those things is the um, bricks out of mushrooms. <laughs> so <laughs> we can do a demonstration mm -hmm. on that. How did that get discovered? We spent a long time researching topics for the exhibition as a whole and went to a lot of different conferences and listened to people for interesting subject areas and in particular looking for possible hands-on activities. There's a lot of challenges when you're designing with a living thing um, since they're alive, they're slow, they're sensitive um, and we heard a talk about people using working on cutting-edge biomaterials and using mushrooms as a substrate to create these biomaterials. Um, and we were just enamored with that because it's, it's environmentally friendly, it is sustainable, it has all these great features, but then it also uses a living thing. Um, and so we, we found a, we contacted one of the local startups that is doing this, uh, Microworks, and they've been our partner in helping to develop an experience that works in the museum setting. Um, so, yeah. Well, let's show them our demonstration. Great. Well, we're just going to start our demo, and in preparation, I have my beautiful blue gloves on. Great. Um, and she actually has the gloves on not to protect her from anything that we're going to do, but to protect the living mushroom that we're working with from the, the bacteria on her hands. Um, just to start off with, I can show a few examples of what you can grow using nature's technology. So this is a block that has been grown from sawdust and living mushroom cells. We think that's a really cool technology because it's environmentally friendly, sustainable, and you can use it to replace things like styrofoam and wood, and it's way better for the environment. So to start off with, you have your gloves on. What you're going to do first is use this mushroom material. So you can feel that it's a little bit soft. That's wood chips and mushroom cells. So now that you have that in one hand, why don't you use your other hand and select what shape object you want to make. Oh, let's have this one. Great, okay, and pick up all, all pieces, and I'll grab this one for you, yep. And so I'm going to press it in there? Yep, exactly. So you have this nice little chamber, and you can just push it in and fill it up as full as you would like it. It's kind of like cookie dough. <laughs> it kind of is. Yes. Um, it's a little moist because it is alive at this point. There's mushroom cells in there that are alive. Um, and once it's about full to the top, this top piece you can see is called the press. If, if you put it on and push it down, it will help make the top of your brick nice and flat. It's a messy brick. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to put this on I the chart. Put it on top. Now we need to get it out of that mold. Okay. And what we're going to use now is this special piece that we are calling our brick remover. And if you put it down, it should match that shape. And there's thumbprints there on the side. Yes, there's little And if you do that and pull up on the side handles, pull up on the side handles, it should pop right out. And so if you pick that up now, you can see that you have some mushroom material shaped in the shape that we want. Since it's a living thing though, before it becomes a solid object like these ones, we're gonna have to let it grow. It doesn't happen overnight. And so we put it in a special environmental chamber that keeps it humid and it grows over a week. After about three days, which you can see the example up there, after about three days, the white mycelium has grown through it and it started to stick together. So at three days, we take it off the base and we flip it over. So then the other, the bottom can grow as well too. So if you want to have a go at doing this yourself, Tech. the Tech Museum of Innovation would love to see you there. Well, that was so much fun. Thank you for including me. Thank you for getting your hands dirty. <laughs> <laughs> Stereotypically, um, in the past, we thought, well, boys can do this and girls can do that. Mm -hmm. Do you use the same thinking to try and get girls and boys to do 
everything? Well, one of our main focuses at the museum is to try to get more girls involved in STEM learning. And so we have a lot of programs that we offer um, trying to get that goal to fruition. So one of the things that we do is we do something called Girls Day, where we invite all sorts of girls who are interested in STEM learning to come along with their brothers and explore the museum together. We also invite a lot of lecturers and educators from around the world to come and talk on subjects that directly relate to that so that the whole community can embrace this new push to have more females in, in STEM learning programs. So Jimmy, yes. the tech challenge has been going on for what, about 30 years? Yes. And um, tell us what some of the challenges are and how it got introduced in the first place. One of the very first signature programs of the museum was the Tech Challenge. Um, it is an educational design challenge um, that we present to school age children from elementary school all the way up to high school. Every year we give them some sort of engineering challenge that they have to tackle. In previous years we've focused on things like designing buildings that could withstand certain amounts of earthquakes. What's exciting is that every year they come together in April to come and present um, their their equipment and the things that they've come up with over the course of their journey. And they compete head to head um, in front of a panel of judges from all over the Silicon Valley to look at their designs um, and to encourage them along in their path uh, using technology to solve engineering problems. Do you supply the materials or do they get their own materials? So they normally get their own materials. Um, what we do is we give them a series of constraints that they have to abide by. So in terms of things like the glider, you couldn't have um, anything that was in a pre-made kit or anything like that. Um, what we do offer is we offer a lot of educational seminars that they can come down, visit with some of our judges and some of our engineers that will give them pointers along the way. But mostly they supply their own, um, their own materials, their own thoughts and ideas as they incorporate it going towards their end goal. What do you think is the most important thing that youth can take aw away from this experience? Well, there are many, many things that we see um, that, our, that our participants walk away with. Um, a lot of that has to do with um, teamwork, uh, public speaking, since they have to present it in front of a huge room um, of all sorts of important individuals from around the Bay Area. But the number one most important thing um, we already touched on, which is embracing failure. Part of being an innovator is learning from mistakes instead of just ending your tinkering at that moment. And so almost all of the participants that come through the Tech Challenge and clowner failure at some point along the way. And embracing of that and learning from those mistakes to reaching a positive end goal is one of the things we pride ourselves at the Tech. So the Tech Awards are another another mm -hmm. aspect of it. And uh, you do that once a year as well. That's correct. And you honor people, um, laureates, who do things to benefit the community. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. What the Tech Awards are is we wanted to find a way to encourage people from all around the world in a global sense to use technology in some way to benefit humanity. So we do get have laureates that are nominated to us throughout the year that are using technology in some way to help out on a global scale. And then every November we have an award ceremony where we get them all together in one room and we um, give them grants of upwards of $25,000 uh, to further fund their endeavors in those fields. What kind of projects? So some of the things that they've done in the past, one of my favorites is called the Embrace Warmer. Um, a group of Stanford students was noticing that we had a problem where in developing worlds, if you had a baby that was born prematurely, they couldn't monitor their own body warmth. And so since they didn't have access to incubators, you had a high mortality rate. But with the Embrace Warmer, it's very cheap to manufacture, it's reusable, and so you can send them there um, and they can use them to regulate their body temperatures using this device. They actually saved over 200,000 infants last year using this device. And so oh. that's just one of the many things that they have and we awarded money to um, at the Tech Awards. That's wonderful, mm -hmm. absolutely wonderful that it should come from that. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously you're very enthusiastic, I can see that. <laughs> what is the most favorite part of your job? The favorite part of my job is as the training supervisor, I'm the first face that many of our volunteers and staff see when they join us at the museum. And so I have the pleasure of introducing them to all of the fun and really unique stuff that we encounter every day on the floor. Um, and so I like being the first person to show them that and use that enthusiasm when I'm introducing new people to the museum. How about you, Anya? The, the favorite part? Oh, 
There are so many favorites. Um, one of my most favorite parts is the part of the design and development process where you get on the floor and prototype your early ideas with uh, visitors of all ages. So it's fun to have a, a concept and really dig into it and come up with all these crazy ideas about how you might engage visitors with that concept. Um, but then it's fun to get on the floor and test your test whether your concept of how it might be um, brought to visitors is actually even something that is in line with what people want, if it's interesting to them, um, and talking about embracing failure, sometimes we take out prototypes and people just don't get it at all. Um, so I find that the most fun part is the taking what you've been thinking about yourself for months and seeing what other people think about it um, mm -hmm. and if it's successful. You do a lot for the community, you do a lot for youth. How can the community help you? Uh, they can help us by being volunteers, mm -hmm. um, giving donations, and I think Jimmy has some more specifics about how the volunteers Absolutely. can actually connect with the right person, that being the training. The training so provider. in addition to just general donations to help us with our tech campaigns, we also have a huge volunteering staff where we have people that donate their time throughout the year to come down and help us out on the floor. I always like to encourage all of our volunteers um, to be the face of our museum because without it, we're just a bunch of machines that are just sitting out there. So our volunteers really are the face of the museum, teaching people what these devices are, how they work, and how to utilize them to make the globe a better place to be. Well, the tech inspires everyone, and it's creating a culture of innovation, mm -hmm. the name of our program. So I thank you both for coming and keep up the good work. Of course, thank you so thank much you. for having us. This is great. Thank you. We hope that you've enjoyed today's program and will join us again. The better part is always looking for volunteers 50 plus to help us make our shows. We'll show you how. It's very educational and a lot of fun. So why not give it a try? For more information, call the Cupertino Senior Center 408 777-3150 or visit our website www.thebetterpart.com Tune in again and we'd love to see you at The Better Part. Thank you for watching.